All right, thank you everyone for coming out today. Uh, it's great turnout, uh, so really appreciate that on the, the last day of I.O. here. Today I'm going to be talking about knowledge-based application design patterns. My name is Sean Simister. I work in developer relations here at Google. I work with the Knowledge Group, uh, which, as you might know, includes Search, but it also covers a lot of other uh, developer products like Freebase, Google Refine, Schema.org, um, and the, now the Knowledge Graph. I've been building web apps for over 10 years now, uh, working in developer relations for a year. I've been a member of Freebase community since it started five years ago. Um, and this presentation is sort of uh, collections of lessons that I've learned from building applications on top of a knowledge graph and also from helping developers like yourselves build applications on top of a knowledge graph. So what does it mean to be a knowledge base application? The web is changing. Uh, the web is changing from be being a web of documents to becoming a web of things. User expect, uh, the users expect applications that know about real world things real world things that they care about and not just you know, pages and links that they can um, do things with. This creates opportunities to build new types of applications and enhance existing applications. So today I'm gonna to show you some examples of applications built on top of a knowledge graph. I'm gonna show you some design patterns to help you tap into the power of the knowledge graph. And we're gonna look at some code samples to help you get started. So most of you have probably seen this now. This is. Uh, the knowledge graph, Google's knowledge graph showing up in search. Uh, we launched this this month, and if you search for a thing in Google, uh, most likely you'll see one of these cards here uh, that gives you some information about that entity. Uh, Google's knowledge graph has over 500 million entities, uh, 3.5 billion facts about those entities, um, and it's being integrated to more and more parts of Google. So uh, on Wednesday's keynote, I'm sure you saw uh, the knowledge graph showing up in Android as well. So what is a knowledge graph? A knowledge graph is a collection of entities. Um, well, first and foremost, it's a graph. And uh, as you can see here, this is the graph representation of that knowledge panel that we just saw. Um, and so each one of these little circles, or nodes in the graph, are the, the real world things, the entities that we're talking about. And then the lines that connect them together are the edges, uh, those 3.5 3 billion facts and these are actual meaningful relationships between entities. We're not just saying that they're related in some way, we're saying exactly how they're related. Uh, so you can see here uh, all the information that we had in search. This is how it looks in the graph. Uh, some of the topics are entities, or some of the nodes are entities. Some of the nodes are actually uh, mediator nodes. So you can see uh, like a film performance. It shows uh, what character he played in that film or uh, for his spouse, it'll show what time period uh, that person was married to him. Um, and so all this data gets pulled together and displayed in search or other applications. Um, and this is really useful. This can be really useful for your applications as well um, because Knowledge Graph is very high quality data. It's uh, deduplicated, so there's no ambig ambiguity between different entities. Uh, you know, we know that this is the Chuck Norris that acts in uh, Walker, Texas Ranger, not some other Chuck Norris, just because the name matches. Um, and most importantly, it's searchable. So we've come up with some really interesting ways of letting you use this data in your application. Uh, now I'm gonna talk a little bit about Freebase's knowledge graph. Uh, so Freebase started off as a local startup called MetaWeb. Uh, MetaWeb was acquired by Google in 2010, and that team went on to help build the knowledge graph here at Google. Uh, Freebase lives on as the open, uh, public-facing part of the knowledge graph. It's uh, crowdsourced, uh, so anyone can contribute, like uh, Wikipedia. Uh, there's 2.3 million topics, um, and those are organized into over 2,000 different types of things, people, places, locations, events, all that sort of stuff. Uh, we have RESTful APIs that let you tap into that, and I'll show you that a little bit later in the presentation. Um, everything is licensed under a Creative Commons attribution license. Uh, so it's very easy to take data out, use it, use it commercially, um, as long as you give attribution back to Freebase. Uh, there's complete data dumps, so at any point you can download everything, all those 23 million topics, and do whatever you want with them. Um, and most importantly, it's, it's one of the, the major sources for Google's knowledge graph. Um, so a lot of that high-quality data from Freebase uh, 
winds up being in the knowledge graph and in, in those products at Google. So this is what Freebase looks like. Uh, every one of those 23 million entities in Freebase has its own page, uh, as well as the schema. All the types, those 2,000 commons types, have their own page like this. Uh, and every property even has its own page. And anyone with a Google account can log in. Uh, anyone with a Gmail account can log in and, uh, and contribute data, uh, create new schema, add topics, fix errors, much like you would with uh, something like Wikipedia. So let's imagine what sort of applications you can build with this type of knowledge graph. Um, you can build applications that understand real world entities, the real people, places, and things that the users care about. Uh, you can build applications that allow users to interact with these entities in new ways that they couldn't before. You can build applications that scale to millions of topics rather than just a small list of hand curated topics. So next we're gonna look at some ways that you can build these sorts of applications right now. We're gonna look at uh, some discovery patterns which are ways to convert strings into things, and we'll go into that uh, shortly. Uh, we'll look at interaction patterns, which are ways of navigating through the knowledge graph uh, to find interesting pieces of data. And finally, we'll look at presentation patterns, which is ways to display that data to the user uh, in informative ways, put it in context with your content. So discovery patterns. Discovery patterns cover uh, as I said, turning strings into things, taking the user input and figuring out which entities they're talking about. Um, and so this is usually the first step in your application. Uh, this is usually um, how, how you start, how you, how you go from user input to, to a knowledge graph. But it's not just limited to strings either. Um, as we've seen, you, know, you can have voice input, uh, you can give it a URL. Uh, we'll see some examples of taking documents and getting entities out of them. So the first pattern we'll look at is the reconciliation pattern. And the problem that this addresses is when a user has an entity in mind, they have some keywords, they want to describe it to you, but they don't know uh, what the identifier of that entity is in your graph, how to, how to look it up in your knowledge graph of you know, 500 million entities. Uh, keywords can be ambiguous. You know, if they type in John Smith, what do you give them back? Um, and, uh, there are some problems too of, you know, even when you show them the entity, how do you know that this is the one that they're looking for? Uh, so there's a couple solutions that we've come up with. The first is the easiest one, which is just to come up with a list of matching entities, you know, show them all the John Smiths and let them pick from that list. Uh, that doesn't always scale. You need some way to rank the, the matches as well. Um, but we'll, we'll sh uh, show you how that works. Uh, the other way is to use reconciliation algorithms to do it automatically. Um, so we have uh, a number of techniques that we use internally, and uh, we're, we're working on ways to open that up to developers, but basically you look at the different properties and you say, you know, do these people have the same birth date? Does this company have the same uh, location for their headquarters? And you match them that way. Um, and then what we've found is the best technique is to combine both of those. So use the algorithm to match, you know, 80% uh, of them and then use uh, humans to match the last 20%, the really hard ones that the algorithms can't match. So let's look at an, at an example of that. Uh, Ranker.com is uh, a site that lets you create and uh, share ranked lists of things. Um, and so they use Freebase data as a source for those things. Um, and here we see their list editor um, where uh, I'm creating a new list of the best movie villains of all time. And I wanna add Goldfinger. Um, so here they're using the reconciliation pattern to let me type in some text, give me some suggestions of entities that match in their site, um, and then let me select those. And you can see here that it also gives us the, well, it's a little bit small at the bottom, but it also gives us the option to create a new entity uh, if it doesn't exist. So that, that lets them grow their, their knowledge graph as well. This is Freebase Suggest. Um, this is an open source jQuery plugin that we created. And let me just show you uh, why we created this to help you do reconciliation in your apps. Um, so say I'm looking for a film director. Uh, I'm looking for Francis Ford Coppola. I'm gonna start typing Francis 
board. All right. So now you see it's, it's come up with a couple matches. Uh, and I can hover over those and see a, a short description of what that entity is like. Um, and you can see it's giving me some clues, like uh, you know, a photo, it's a pretty strong clue. Date of birth, again, another strong clue. Um, so I'll click on this one. And you can see here, this is the code that I used. Uh, very simple, one line of uh, JavaScript, jQuery. Um, and this is the data that I get back. So I'm getting back the name, but I'm also getting back the unique ID in the Freebase knowledge graph uh, for that entity. And then I can use that in my application to do a whole bunch of things, which we'll see in a second. Um, this also has an API, so a RESTful API, where you can call this, so you can just pass text and get back uh, those suggestions as, as JSON data. So it's very easy to add this reconciliation to your application and to do that sort of uh, entity-based recommendation. So when would you use this? Uh, like I said, when we need entity IDs for known entity names, so when uh, the user has an entity in mind but they don't know which ID it corresponds to in our database or our graph, uh, when we need to disambiguate, when we don't know which John Smith they're talking about, um, and when we can't, can't use tags to organize our content, when we have too much content that tagging would lead to too many ambiguities, then we can actually annotate content with entities instead. Uh, let's see one more example of that reconciliation pattern. Uh, this is a, an app, social app called Amen, and uh, it lets you st state strong opinions about real world things. And they actually use Freebase data to let people uh, select an entity and then state a strong opinion about it um, and then share that with their friends. And one of the interesting things about that is that once you've shared that, um, they actually know about the entities that you're sharing your opinion about. So you can click on an entity, um, you know, say it says uh, Blue Bottle Coffee uh, is the best place for coffee in San Francisco, you can click on that blue bottle coffee and see all the other, recommend, or all the other opinions that people have had about that entity. Uh, so it, it opens up some new possibilities for how you want to uh, interact with the data. The second discovery pattern we're going to look at is called the detection pattern. Um, and this is where uh, a user wants to learn more about some subject matter, but it's not just a string. It's maybe an article or an image or a video. Uh, something that they couldn't easily just type into a text box like we saw. Um, so there are a number of solutions for this. Uh, the most common one is called named entity recognition. Uh, so this is a family of algorithms that people use to automatically detect named entities, uh, these things, from uh, an article. Um, another way to do it is to use structured markup. Uh, so there's a lot more web pages these days using things like schema.org, RDFA, microformats. Um, and you can actually use that to pull the things out of the page and then use the reconciliation pattern that we just saw to figure out which entities they correspond to in the knowledge graph. This is uh, DBpedia Spotlight. Uh, this is an open source project built on top of DBpedia. Uh, DBpedia is a project uh, that's goal is to extract structured data from Wikipedia. Uh, so it's a lot like Freebase in that sense, except for it's limited to just Wikipedia uh, and they produce RDF data. And they've created this, this incredible tool to do named entity recognition using DBpedia data. The great thing is that because Freebase and uh, DBpedia are both using Wikipedia data, all of our IDs link together quite easily. So you can actually use DBpedia to get the IDs out and then convert those into Freebase IDs quite easily and use that app, uh, data in your application. So when do you use this? You use this when you have a lot of content. Um, you know, thousands of articles or more content than you could annotate by hand. Uh, when you need to identify uh, relevant entities with your content, so say you have a lot of user-generated content and you want to be able to navigate that uh, in ways like we saw with Amen that are related to the entities being discussed, you can use this. Um, and yeah, like I said, when we just have too much content to mark up. Uh, a number of other services, Open Calais, Alchemy API, Samantha, they all use Freebase identifiers to look up entities and text. Uh, so um, a lot of great APIs that you can use to, to mash up that data with other sources. So that was discovery patterns. That's how you go from uh, raw content or user input to IDs in your knowledge graph. Now we're going to look at interaction patterns, which is once you have those entity IDs, 
what sort of interesting things can you do with them? How can you use that to uh, find interesting paths through the, through the graph? So the first uh, pattern that we're going to look at is called the faceting pattern. Um, and the problem is that the first step might have returned a lot of results. You might have said, you know, I want to find um, computer programmers. And it returns, you know, thousands of results. Now what do you do? Um, a lot of times, the, the data that the user is looking for is large. It's not, not all of it is that interesting. Um, you want to find a way to filter it down, but you don't know, uh, there's no specific way that you can filter it down. If you're dealing with an entity of 500 million topics, uh, thousands of different types of topics, there's no single way to organize that. So facets are a very flexible way to let the user drill down into that data. Uh, basically how it works is you look at all the different properties of the data, um, and you count up how frequently each one occurs, and you let the user choose. Uh, so you can see here this image I have is from Google Refine, uh, which is a product that we, we've open sourced for working with messy data. Um, and uh, it's, it's taken some zip codes, counted them up, uh, and we let the user click on those to see just the data that concerns that zip code or uh, um, political party here. Um, and so the idea is you give the user a broad overview of what sort of data they're looking at, let them click on it, filter down those results until they find you know, a smaller set of entities that they're, they're really interested in. One of the areas where we've done this is actually in Google search. Uh, if you do a Google search for something that looks like an entity, or something that looks like a, sorry, a, a recipe, um, we actually do faceted search on the side. So here, uh, I've done a search for margarita recipe, and you can see that we faceted you know, popular ingredients, the cooking time, the number of calories in the recipe. Um, I don't know why you'd be concerned with calories for margarita, but, uh, um, and so if you, if you click on any one of those facets, you can actually filter that down. It does, it automatically does a constrained Google search um, and really lets you dig into that data quite quickly. So this is an example of the uh, MQL, MQL query language that Freebase uses to search entities. Uh, at the top here, we have uh, a query for our, our API, and at the bottom is the result. Uh, you can see it's just a simple JSON structure. Uh, it's query by example. So here we're asking for the ID and the name of things in our graph, which have the profession, software developer, and the type uh, people person. And you can see in the bottom half with the results, it's filled in some of those null values. Uh, we have ESR, uh, Sergey Brin, uh, but if you actually run that on the Freebase API, you'll get uh, over 100 uh, results of famous programmers. Um, so this sort of query could easily be used to generate those facets um, using Freebase data in your application. Uh, here we can see using the Google API client library in Python, um, it, it's very simple to take that same query that we had on the previous slide here, at the top, um, and pass that in uh, to the Freebase uh, API service and get that data back in Python. Uh, it's not just Python, there's libraries for Java, JavaScript, PHP, Ruby. Um, it's quite a few and we're, we're creating more. So when would you use this? Uh, again, when you have too many facts about an entity, you're not sure which ones the user are, are interested in, you need to uh, filter down a little bit more. Uh, or also when you have sparse or undifferentiated data, so maybe you have you know, two million topics called John Smith and 80% of them don't really have any interesting data associated with them and you're looking for the, the most notable famous ones, uh, you can use faceting to narrow it down that way. Um, and mostly just when you have so many results that you can't provide pages and pages of results that people can go through. Um, so as I was talking about earlier, this is Google Refine. This is a tool that we built to uh, clean up messy data, um, and it relies exclusively on, uh, or extensively on, on faceting to let users drill down into large data sets, uh, hundreds of thousands of rows of data, um, and so they can create custom facets on the left-hand side there to drill down into this data. Um, and we actually created this tool as a way to load entities into uh, the Freebase Knowledge Graph.
The next pattern we're going to look at is the recommendation pattern. Um, so this is when you have a large knowledge graph and you want to encourage people to explore through it. Um, if, if you have 500 million entities, you know, how are you going to get uh, people to visit all those entities um, when they might just look for the most popular ones? Um, so the great thing is because everything in our graph is a node connected with edges, we know how they're related and we know how, how closely they're related. Um, so we can actually come up with meaningful recommendations for what other entities you might be interested in or what other content you might be interested in based on the entities that are being discussed. Um, and not only can we say that they're related, but we can even tell you how they're related. Um, so that makes uh, really strong recommendations for why you should check out that other content. Uh, we can go back to the example with the knowledge graph here, which is what we've done. Um, so we say, all right, you're interested in Chuck Norris. You might also be interested in some of the movies or TV shows that he's done. Um, so we can recommend some of the mo most notable ones here, and we can actually tell you that we know, you know their uh, movies and TV shows with Chuck Norris. Uh, so it's a stronger recommendation than uh, the one before, which is just um, things that you've also searched for. So when would you use this? Um, like I said, when there are too many possible ways to organize the content, uh, you can't just come up with a, a single uh, hierarchy for browsing the data, um, especially when you have uh, things like music or movies, which users have a really personalized preference for. Uh, you're going to want to use recommendation uh, in that case um, because there's no, no single way to, to give users the, uh, the best movie for every user without using recommendation. This is one more example. This is a, a service called Ukabu. It's a repository of freely licensed images organized by entity. Uh, so this comes, the data all comes from Freebase and the Wikimedia Commons. Um, every entity in Ukabu has its own page. So here you can see it's a page for F22 Raptor pictures. Um, there's pictures about that entity. And then over on the right-hand side, there's uh, related entities as well. So you can see it's not, just, uh, it's not just keyword matches, it's actually related to the same domain, so either uh, US Air Force or F-16, F-35, that sort of thing. Uh, so Ukubu uses Freebase data to figure out which entities might be related, um, and that makes it easier to explore this large uh, corpus of images in interesting ways. So those were the interaction patterns. That's how you uh, can kind of dig through a large amount of content using entities. Uh, now we're going to look at presentation patterns, which is kind of the last stage of your application. This is, um, this is how you take, take this entity data, present it to the user, uh, show them that you know which things they're talking about, which things they care about, and let them do interesting things with that. Um, it's not just you know, a shiny kind of distraction visualization. Uh, all this data coming from the graph are, is real factual data, so when you're putting that on the screen, that's really helping the user out uh, and showing them uh, something interesting about these topics. Uh, and this is really the key to using a knowledge graph with existing content or user-generated content um, by being able to mash it up with the, the data from the knowledge graph. So we'll see some examples of how that works. So the first pattern uh, is the simplest one. This is the uh, summarization pattern, and this is just when we want to describe an entity. Uh, so the user has done a search for something, or the user has selected something from Freebase Suggest, and we want to give them that confirmation that we know which entity they're talking about, and we need to come up with a, a short, concise description of what it, what it is. Um, so the solution is, uh, is to show you know, things like image, description, uh, Disambiguating properties like date of birth, um, you know what uh, what year a movie came out in. Sometimes there's uh, multiple movies with the same name but came out in different years, remakes, that sort of thing. Um, so let's see an example of how that works. Uh, so you'll recognize this is Freebase Suggest, like we had before, but we're actually going to use uh, brand new. Uh, Freebase Topic API, which we're, uh, we're launching today, to get a nice little summary of that topic. So let's look for Chuck Norris. You can see it's suggesting entities here. 
Um, and this is all live. This is going off of uh, the Freebase Knowledge Graph uh, right now. So you can try this yourself. Um, so we'll select first result there. It looks like the right one. You can see it's pr provided a little summary here for us. Um, but we actually used the, the topic API uh, with uh, some jQuery. Um, I didn't show the, the whole uh, code snippet here, but uh, you can do view source on the slides to see um, how you build this little topic summary to confirm with the user that this is actually the entity that they're talking about. So when would we use this? Um, when we have content that needs to be put in context. Um, so we'll see an example of that in a second. Um, but basically when you want to say this, this article or this video uh, talks about this specific content, not just uh, you know, a tag like John Smith, but an actual, an actual entity that you can click on and, and find out more information about. Um, and also when we want to encourage users to navigate the site in a way which relates to entities. So uh, I, I, we've seen this with search. Um, when we started showing the knowledge cards, uh, people started clicking a lot on all those blue links, uh, navigating search in new ways uh, based on things and the relationships between things rather than just uh, searching by keyword. Uh, so this is an example from the Wall Street Journal. Um, and they're using Freebase data to, uh, to add that sort of uh, navigation structure to their content. Um, so this is a, an article uh, that does kind of like their, their weekly movie reviews. Um, and there's four different movies all being reviewed in this article. But you can see on the right-hand side here, uh, they have a little summary of each entity. Uh, that data is all coming from Freebase. And that gives you a quick snapshot of which entities are being talked about in this article. Um, but it also lets you click through to find out more information about the director um, or related reviews. So this is a great way that they can encourage their users to navigate uh, their content based on the entities that are being discussed. Uh, I should also mention that none of this would be possible if they hadn't reconciled their entities. So that first reconciliation uh, pattern that we saw in the discovery patterns at the beginning, um, they're only able to display these, uh, these recommendations and these entities because they've matched all the things in their knowledge base to the things in Freebase. Um, it's also a great example of a mashup pattern, which is what we're going to see next, um, where they're combining their content with content from the knowledge graph. So the mashup pattern. The mashup pattern is when a user wants to see different types of information about the same entity. Um, so it could be that they, they want to know, you know, videos from YouTube, text from Wikipedia, uh, facts from Freebase, they want to mash that all up in one location and see uh, you know, everything there is to know about this entity. Um, or it could all be from the same source, but it could be different, uh, different perspectives on the same entity. Um, so some entities, some people uh, are also politicians, are also authors, have also appeared in films, and you might want to break that down by different, different uh, genres, different perspectives on the same entity. Uh, the problem is it's hard to combine these, uh, this data from all these different sources um, if you're not using strong identifiers. If you just do a keyword search on YouTube for your John Smith entity, you're not going to get back high quality relevant data that you can mash up with uh, you know, whatever you found with a keyword search of, for John Smith on Wikipedia. But if you have strong identifiers, uh, ways to link that together, uh, you can create really, really good mashups. So the solution is to uh, create those links, um, either through uh, manual reconciliation or those automatic reconciliation algorithms we saw, um, or to use existing links in a source like Freebase. Um, and this encourages users to jump between the different contexts uh, for that same entity. Um, when they know that they can rely on it being the exact same topic, they're more likely to, to click around. So we'll see an example here. Uh, this is a this is Siebel, um, which is a, a Chrome extension that works with YouTube. And so what Siebel's done is, uh, when you go to YouTube, when you're looking at you know say a music video, 
they'll reconcile that to the, the artist in Freebase, figure out which artist you're talking about, and then display some recommendations here on the side, um, additional videos, facts about it, um, and uh, you know, links to, to uh, more information about that artist. Um, they're able to make really strong recommendations using the recommendation pattern because they have that information in the Freebase graph about um, how, how this artist relates to other artists. So this is an example using that topic API that I showed you earlier of how to just go into Freebase and get all these identifiers. Um, so right here we're looking up uh, San Francisco and we're saying, give me all the foreign keys, all these identifiers on other sites that you know about for San Francisco. And uh, so we have a number of different uh, key sources. It's gonna return you know, the Wikipedia URL. It's gonna return um, a, number of, a number of different sources uh, that all talk about that San Francisco entity um, and not just things that match the San Francisco keyword. So when would you use this? When you need to see information from different perspectives um, and when you need to mash up uh, data from different sources. Um, so when it's not, when you can't get all the information from one source, you need to combine it on your website. You need to be able to have these identifiers to look it up on other websites. And a great resource for this is a site called sameas.org. Uh, sameas.org is a data hub that links together all these different data sets on the web uh, it's completely open, so anyone who owns a data set can contribute their, uh, their links to this data set. Uh, so Freebase has contributed all their entity IDs to sameas.org. Uh, there's a simple JSON API, so you can see here I've looked up the, uh, the Freebase RDF uh, URL for uh, the San Francisco topic we were just looking at, and it's returned a list of all the equivalent uh, identifiers on the web for that entity, so uh, the identifiers at uh, New York Times, uh, you can see Ukubu is in there, um, GeoNames, Wikipedia, uh, and there's, there's quite a few data sets and they're, they're always adding more. So this is a great example of how you can easily combine data from different sources once you have those entity identifiers. The last pattern we're gonna look at is the visualization pattern. And this is when you have uh, many different entities that you want to display. Uh, more than, you know, just the four entities that you saw in that uh, Wall Street Journal article, what if you have 40? How do you display those? Um, and also, the, the different entities on the Wall Street Journal article uh, were only related because they came out in the same week. But what if there's more meaningful relationships between the entities? How do you show the relationships as well as, you know, the facts and the image related to those entities? Uh, so there are a number of different solutions to this, but basically you can use data visualization techniques to display a lot of entities at the same time um, while also keeping some of the semantics about how they're related. Uh, so for example, if you have you know, families or organizations uh, with people in it, you can visualize that as a tree. If you have places or events, you can visualize that on a map. Um, events can also be visualized on a timeline, as we'll see in a second. Uh, one of the easiest ways is you can just visualize it as a graph. So that slide I showed you at the beginning where Chuck Norris is, you know, a node connected by other, uh, to other nodes with edges, uh, that's one way of visualizing it. Um, and also bubble charts are a really interesting way to um, visualize a lot of information about entities when there's no easier way to do it like maps or timelines. So this is ThinkBase. This is uh, an interface that someone built on top of uh, Freebase. And I'd encourage you to check it out uh, afterwards. There's a, a link there at the bottom. Um, it's an interactive interface to Freebase. Oops. Um, so here I've, I've looked up uh, Prometheus the movie, um, and it's expanded a number of the relationships for me. And I can, I can see the different related entities, how they're related. I can click on those to explore uh, what what other entities are related to those. Um, so it's a really interesting way to explore the data. Uh, if you get to some really dense topics like United States that have a lot of entities connected to them, 
uh, it can get a little bit, a little bit confusing. Uh, but in most cases, it's it's a pretty cool way to to navigate. Um, so we use visualization patterns when it's important to be able to see the relationships between multiple entities at the same time. Um, and like I said, when there's there's far too many different entities that we want to show to be able to just list them, uh, like you saw in the Wall Street Journal article. The last example I want to show you here is uh, an amazing site called Conflict History. Um, again, they are using freebase data to mash up a lot of different entities about different military conflicts uh, over the centuries. Um, and actually, you can see here they've got a map. Um, so they've plotted all these different events on a map, uh, but they're also plotting them on a timeline at the same time. So let me see if I can just open that up here. This is actually a great example of, of using a lot of these different visualization techniques together in the same map. Uh, so here we can see that, that map. It's pulling the data out of the knowledge graph, plotting it on the map. We've also got this timeline. Um, so we can drag this little window at the bottom, or we can expand it as well um, to see military conflicts that happen uh, in this time period and in this, this part of the world. We can hover over any of the entities, and you can see it's, it's pointing to the, uh, the item in the list that corresponds to this, this conflict. Um, and then you can actually go here and click on more information, and uh, they're using that mashup pattern to pull in data from Wikipedia using those identifiers in Freebase uh, to tell you more about uh, the Battle of Taiobe. So to sum things up here, uh, we first looked at discovery patterns, which was a way to surface entities in your application to take uh, the, the strings or the, the input that the user is giving you and convert that into things. Uh, we then looked at interaction patterns, which is a way to navigate through a knowledge graph uh, to facet or to make recommendations based on what you think the user might be interested in. And then we finished with presentation patterns as a way to create informative user interfaces uh, and surface those entities in your content. Um, so I hope that this encourages you to uh, consider adding entity data to your application, consider building applications on top of Freebase or other knowledge graphs. Um, and I put together a list of links here um, to the APIs that I mentioned, to uh, some of the, the code libraries, and also tools like Google Refine and DBpedia Spotlight, uh, so you can dig in and, and try out some of these examples that I've showed you today. Um, and this is not just for creating new apps. Uh, this is also a great way to extend existing apps and uh, create new, new ways of exploring data that you've already collected. So thank you very much for coming out. I've put a copy of the slides at uh, knowledgedesignpatterns.com so you can check out all the examples, uh, click through to all the links there. This is my Google Plus profile, so feel free to follow me and uh, ask me questions. I know. But if you go to the, the URL, then you can click on the link. Um, and you can also follow me on Twitter, which is a little bit shorter, I guess. Um, so yeah, I'm going to invite my colleague Michael Mazuris up here on stage. Uh, Michael works on Freebase and the Knowledge Graph here at Google. Um, and we'd be happy to take any of your questions, or we'll be uh, hanging around here afterwards if uh, you have more questions. Now we have microphones here in the aisles, if you would. Uh, 
Um, I, I'm not all that familiar with uh, Freebase, although it looks great. I was just wondering, um, is there the concept of a schema when you have something of a certain type, like you showed all these movies on the Wall Street Journal site? Are they able to, you know, assume there's going to be a director and a, you know, producer and actors and actresses and stuff? Or um, is there not really that sort of a, you know, structure to the to the uh, information? Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, yeah, every every entity in Freebase can have one or more types uh, applied to it, and the types are actually nodes in the graph as well. Um, so you can go to Freebase and you can look up you know, that uh, people person type or the movie type or the director type, and you can see which properties uh, are suggested for that, that type of entity. Um, and so yeah, it, it's, it's really cool the way that the topics and the types and the properties are all modeled as nodes in the graph, and you can query any of them using the APIs. I mean, that, that sounds very open-ended. I was wondering, though, is it that there's a structure, something that is a movie is going to have certain types filled in, or else it's just considered an incomplete record, and maybe you could filter that out in your results and say, only give me the ones that have been properly, uh, for you know, is there a constraint, sort of? Yeah, so there, there aren't, there aren't uh, any really hard constraints on which properties have to be there, um, because this data is coming from a number of different sources. We can never really guarantee that you know every every book we find is going to have the author, um, or every film that we have is going to have the release date on it. Um, but that's that's the value of having kind of a crowdsourced knowledge base like Freebase is that people can come along afterwards and fill in those facts. So all the types have properties associated with them, uh, but they're not required. Gotcha. Uh, yes. Hi. I was wondering if there's any kind of um, callback API, so like as this data changes, is there any way to like subscribe to that? Um, there's no specific API to do it, but one of the things we, we have in our uh, MQL uh, search API is uh, you can query based on a timestamp. So you can say, give me all the things that have changed since this timestamp. Um, so that that's one way of doing it. It won't uh, it won't ping you when it's done. You have to kind of pull that data. Um, but you can, all the timestamps for every fact, for every topic when it was created are recorded in the graph, and you can query that through the APIs. Thank you. You're welcome. This is a little bit of a high level question. I, you know, I attended uh, some of your uh, presentation at the, uh, you know, uh, free web and, uh, you know, the yes. ORDF thing. And, with the emergencies of all these platforms, you know, you always see applications that mostly like use this data to display and certainly in, in increase the power of, uh, you know, uh, your presentations. But is there are there any projects that are trying to use this to do some sort of reasoning? I mean, like obviously the the the, the most obvious thing would be like something like Siri, where we're actually trying to actively, you know, answer a question or help users. Is it is there anything like that? Uh, uh, yeah, well, I mean, the, uh, the stuff that you saw in the keynote on, on Wednesday was powered by Google's Knowledge Graph. Okay. So you are doing it, but these projects are internal, so there, there is no uh, outside developers trying to do that based on, on these new uh, data platforms. Um, we, don't, we, don't, we don't actually store this relationship, so if you want to do inference, you have to do it uh, yourself, or, but there's other projects out there like CYC. Right. Uh, are more academic and they are trying to model actually intelligence and relationships in, in the real world between things. Okay, academic. Okay, I, thank you. I know there, there is actually a startup, uh, True Knowledge, uh, that does question answering based on uh, a knowledge graph and they use data from Freebase to be able to do that question answering. Uh, so you mentioned that anyone can contribute to Freebase. Yes. So you have your app and you start getting information from Freebase. Uh, maybe you store in your database some IDs of uh, entities that uh, your users have been using. What happens when Freebase, Freebase gets updated and, I don't know, an entity gets deleted from Freebase but you already have an ID and then you do a query and the entity is not there or maybe the entity was merged with another entity. So what happens with, with the updates and, and then? All right, so there are a number of, number of different parts to that. Uh, the first is that we recommend that if you're building an application, you just store the Freebase ID in your database and uh, whatever other data you're going to add to that entity. Um, but if you cache some of the Freebase data locally, then it gets very complicated. Um, so it's preferable to just store the ID and then pull it live from Freebase. 
Uh, but again, there is still the issue of what if it gets deleted, what if it gets merged or uh, changed in some way, because a lot of entities do uh, split and merge over time. Um, and we actually store all those relationships in the graph. Um, so if an entity gets uh, merged with another one, uh, if you call up that, that previous identifier through the API, you'll get redirected to the new entity. Um, so as much as we can, we handle that in the graph. Yeah, and to add to that, uh, the actual, the Freebase graph is append only, which means the entire history of the graph is available to you and queryable. So at any point, you can actually find out what happened to any entity or any, any piece of data. That's cool, thanks. Um, do the do they, the edges between nodes are they just sort of like there's only one kind of relationship or are there you know more than just like is a or I mean you mentioned the moderator nodes which I guess kind of can act as that sort of so I mean function, there, but there are thousands of different types of of properties relationships um, let me see here I'll go back to the beginning here uh, you can see here. I've labeled oh, okay. there the different yeah, the, edges. They were, the, co um, the coloring is hard to see Oh, yeah, sorry. It's a little <laughs> <laughs> earlier. Um, yeah, if you go, if you go to uh, knowledgedesignpatterns.com, you can, you can zoom in on that a little bit more. Um, but yeah, we have thousands of different types of edges in the graph. Um, they're all, there's all schema for each of them. Uh, do you know if any like of those academic, more academically oriented projects are doing using this for like seeding formal ontology construction or anything like that? Um, ooh, off the top of my head, uh, I think CYC and uh, I don't remember which other. Yeah. Um, we we have a, a freebase uh, group on uh, Mendeley.com, uh, okay. and yeah. there's a collection of like over 100 papers now of people that are using freebase data in an academic setting. Um, so I know there's a lot of natural language programming stuff, and some people that have done things around schema and ontology. Uh, but I can't think of anything off the top of my head. Okay, thanks. Um, hi. hi. How often is the Freebase API, uh, the data in Freebase being updated? Um, like, are you guys pulling data in constantly? Like, if I go update a Wikipedia page, how long does it take before that information makes its way into Freebase? Right, so there's, there's a lot of different sources. Um, obviously, the, the user contributions are real time. Um, so you know some of those those parts of my presentation were live, and uh, you know someone someone might have changed that data uh, as I was speaking. Uh, luckily, that didn't happen. Uh, but uh, the the Wikipedia data, I believe, comes in weekly now. Um, so we have a process that looks for new topics in Wikipedia, uh, automatically extracts them, um, cleans them up, and and imports them into Freebase. There's also a little bit of a lag in that. Um, will only import new topics if they've been filled out to a certain amount to try and prevent. To uh, prevent spam and abuse. And spam and okay. kind of stub pages. And just a real quick second question. What are the API limits around using Freebase? Well, currently there, uh, you can do 100,000 requests per day for free, but uh, there's also a forum there where you can request more quota, and you can describe your project, and we're usually pretty generous and okay. uh, go from there. <laughs> Thank you. It's really cool to uh, see how we can extract, uh, you know, recognizable terms out of text. Um, but I'm curious as uh, to what projects are out there for um, using these extraction patterns on fuzzier data, for example, images and sounds, to identify elements in a knowledge graph and then those types of inputs. Uh, yeah, that's a good question. I don't have I don't have any uh, resources off the top of my head. No, I, I don't know if any for media. No, uh, neither. Uh, I think that uh, a good way to find out is to find out which uh, projects are out there that extract just text or uh, you know, any piece of information out of media, and then do a second pass to reconcile that text with entities. So it's not an extra step to reconcile with Freebase. It's, uh, just a, sorry, it's not a different process to reconcile with Freebase. You just follow the process you're already following to extract information, but then you just reconcile that information with Freebase. We, we've yeah. seen that in some cases with uh, people that had uh, um, a large collection of videos. Um, and so they would actually extract the, the entities from the comments or the text around the videos as a way of kind of um, doing that. But yeah, I'm sorry, I don't have some examples right now of, of images or, or video recognition. Thank you. Um, is there any kind of moderation on the data that goes into Freebase? So can anyone just chuck stuff in and does someone check that it's actually correct? 
Absolutely. So uh, yeah, we have a number of ways of checking data. Um, we have uh, a Freebase Experts group, which is kind of like a community moderation group, which monitors edits coming into Freebase. Um, because as Michael said, everything is append only um, with timestamps and uh, attribution for which user wrote something. Uh, it's very easy for us to go in there and roll back any malicious edits or bad data that's being contributed. Um, so we have a number of dashboards where we'll look for you know, suspicious stuff coming in. Um, and then there are further steps that we do later on to identify bad data, uh, clean that up, and that sort of thing. Indeed, and whenever we actually, there's also tools that help you uh, do loads where other members of the community will QA, QA the quality of the load that you're doing. So that's also helpful to prevent bad data from entering. But in terms of malicious use, like spam or, uh, you know, not, not, not intentionally malicious, we also have uh, spam filters post the fact. So once the data is written in, we recognize that certain patterns are not right, and then we flag them, and then we review them. So if I had, say, an application that did, um, I don't know, information about books or something, then would you encourage, I mean, would it be a good thing for, to get my users to post stuff back up there as well as consume? Is that something that you want to encourage, or do you want it to be more, it's separate, someone puts stuff in, and it's separate, someone takes stuff out? You mean from your own site? Um, yeah, so say I have like a, a web app or a, an Android app or something like that, yeah. I mean, we, we certainly want to encourage as much contribution as possible. Uh, you know, everyone benefits when, when people are cleaning up that data and contributing more facts. Uh, there's one tricky part, which is that uh, when you have kind of distributed communities, um, if, you know, someone is cleaning up a fact on your site in your community of books um, and someone else on Freebase disagrees with that edit and they get into like a little bit of an edit war, how does that communication happen? Um, but in general, we want to encourage as much contribution from, from other communities and, and apps using Freebase. We actually had a platform where people could uh, write uh, small web apps and, uh, and so customize to the particular use case and encourage other users to contribute data. So you, we have a quota for writing because we will try to prevent this sort of like uh, writing bad data. Uh, so what really happens is that you ask for extended quota because the base quota for writing doesn't really give you much. And at that point, we enter a conversation where we see how you present your site and how you teach your users to enter correct data because it's not very straightforward. And if everything is okay, then we increase the quota and then you can, uh, and that's very beneficial for Freebase to do. And okay, thanks. Are there topics that have been identified as very controversial that you guys, <laughs> like how do you deal with controversy? Yeah, um, so one of the things that uh, we do is um, we don't really have any notability requirements like Wikipedia. So, you know, Wikipedia is around, I think, two million and change topics, and uh, uh, Freebase is 23 million topics. Um, so part of that is that we don't have notability standards. People have added, you know, detailed collections of porn stars and, and various things in there. Um, and we, we're creating schema that will mark um, the uh, objectionable content um, so that developers can filter that out in their application or filter it in as the need may be. Um, oh, how about things that are of, of very high, de high academic quality but are still controversial in the academic circles and so forth? Um, so actually, motivated by some of the use cases we have here at Google for using uh, data from the knowledge graph, uh, we're looking at ways to come up with much more detailed categorizations of different types of objectionable content. Um, and we already have some expertise in that area from image search and other parts like YouTube. Do you have sort of plans to include authoritative sources for, of, of information, like government sources? Yeah, yeah. So uh, we, we've been talking to the World Bank about loading uh, some statistical data um, and actually indicating in, in the graph which facts come from the World Bank um, so that people know where that number comes from. And yes, we, we have already loaded some data from the World Bank, and uh, we have other authorities uh, coming up, yeah. And we plan to support this as an official use case. Like, uh, and do you have any sort of plans for, um, for creating uh, like forms to go and save uh, data and put it into entities? And, uh, yeah, yeah, we've been, we've been experimenting with that. Um, yeah, we, we, I mean, the, the topic page is I think here. it's for templates as well. Maybe you want to have templates to go and uh, pull together all these entities 
and present them in a, in a certain way. Semantic Media Wiki does something similar like that, but there's performance issues yeah. for very large data sets. Yeah, in the, uh, the early uh, versions of freebase.com, we, we experimented with a number of different ways, tables and maps and timelines, like I was talking about, for uh, filtering down entities and displaying them. Uh, it got very complicated, and we, we found that developers could do a better job in their application than we could uh, on freebase.com trying to serve everyone. Um, so right now, we just kind of target the API use case. Um, yeah, and I mean, there's a, there's a variety of tools that get you from editing one single fact for a single entity all the way to uploading a data set of 100,000 entities into Freebase. And uh, in, in that spectrum, we have all sorts of uh, actual, actual apps that can help you do what you want to do. In the new Freebase.com that's coming up soon, there is actually an application that works a little bit like you described, where you select, you make a query with the data that you want to see and the data that you want to enter. And that presents you with a grid sort of view where you can go in and then edit a property of every entity, let's say, or something like that. So that tool exists, yes. Oh, one more. <laughs> um, it seems like named entity extraction is kind of the key to being able to use Freebase from just, you know, freeform data. Um, are you aware of any tools that uh, for doing named entity extraction from um, small form content like tweets or Google Plus posts, things mm. like that? Um, nothing that you could use right now that I can think of. I know it's, it's a very active area of research. I've seen papers using Freebase data to do that sort of thing. Um, I also know of a startup that, that's using our data to try and do that, um, but I don't think that they've announced anything yet. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. All right, well, thank you all very much for coming out. I really appreciate that.